Ladies and gentlemen, today we are covering Season 6, Episode 13, Stranger Than Fan Fiction. This is another Daring Do episode in which the we go to a convention for Daring Do and we meet Quibble Pants, voiced by the amazing Pat Oswalt, who does a couple of fanny things and we make fun of some fanny stuff, but then it turns into a Daring Do adventure. I, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Adventucation. <laughs> But then they find out it's real, and yada 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 at the end. Alright. <clears throat> so, uh, This episode sucks. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I actually wanted to share something, just real quick here. Um, so, let, let's do this in order. You read, I'll pack. Anyone ever done that? Just me? <laughs> there have been a few times in the past where I've read, or played, or whatever for someone else while they're packing or working or cooking and in order to help keep them entertained. That's uh, something I've done a few times. Um, and obviously, uh, Twilight is finally, finally getting to go to Griffinstone, which is funny because the timing is now she gets to miss the big convention with her fan, her, her, her you know, AK yearling, so. Poor Twilight. That is a continuity counter, though. This whole episode is a continuity counter by itself, I think. There's there's quite a bit of that enough to justify it, so we're just going to go ahead and add those there. Ooh. Anywho. So, there's a bit of an as you know, and of course we have the don't get too excited, and then, you know, and, you know the camera zooms out. Even though the convention scene... I actually paused the episode here for a few seconds. Because even though the convention scene is basically the size, at least in this shot, of like a high school gym, you know, like, like just the, the basketball court area or something like that, there's a huge amount of detail. Like there's tons of stuff. It's a feast for the eyes is what I like to call this kind of thing. It's something I've studied since my own high school, actually. And yeah, there's, there's just wonderful animation, wonderful camera work, and wonderful details in this episode. I have to take a moment and praise that. Regardless of whatever we think about the content of the episode, that is fantastic. And yeah, for some reason they have a daring do bondage body pillow. We're not going to talk about that ever again. I don't get the body pillow thing in, in general. I really don't. So... This is also a pretty well-designed convention, if I'm being honest. I've been to quite a few conventions in my life. They're usually not this high tier, which is just yet another reason why Equestria is better than real life. In all seriousness, I want you to imagine if you go to, like, a Trek convention, and they had this level of quality of props and, like, uh, activities... You know, like 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 this the the puzzle tile thing, or which sh shoot a little streamers, or jumping into the pit of the 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 styrofoam rocks. I'm sure those kind of conventions exist. I've never been to one. Usually, it's way lower tier than that in terms of expenses, probably because simply setting up a convention is actually horrifically expensive. I mean, I'd probably rather exist in Pokemon than MLP, but that's because I get to be human. Anyways, so <laughs> so there's Quibble. Quibble Pants, actually. Pants, of course, being British for nonsense, and Quibble is obvious. So... <laughs> Let's go ahead and address the big elephant out of the room first. And that elephant is from a, a comment I got two days ago. Two days ago. That's how recent this is over my Voyager stuff. You ready for this? And I quote, I've been trying to enjoy these ruminations as a companion to my favorite shows like Trek and Babylon 5, but I'm done. I gave it a chance. I can't enjoy listening to someone who enjoys finding why he dislikes 80% of the shows I love. It's literally the nerd trope of just complaining about everything, and I guess hoping we think these shows suck. These shows, even when they're not the best episodes, are still better than half the crap out there and are special to me and other fans. You trash Voyager. No, I don't. And you trash Enterprise. No, I don't. Constantly. And these are great shows. You don't even sound critical. You just sound like these shows hurt you. I suggest watching sports or finding something you enjoy watching talk about. I'm going to go find some podcasts made by fans. Two days ago, I got that comment on my Voyager stuff. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't plan this. I, I can't plan these kind of things. <laughs> um, but 
I wanted to mention that because the very idea that I am super negative about Star Trek is always something I find absolutely hysterical. It's a, it's an old accusation. I've gotten that accusation for the better part of about nine years now, which is roughly when I started the Voyager stuff. Um, because oh no, ten years. Sorry, sorry, ten years ago now. Because um, some people seem to think that because I'm honest, that makes me negative. Now. I was actually talking to my mom about this very recently. And forgive me for defending myself here for a moment, but I want to make this very clear. Because um, I, I was talking to my mom about this. This was just last week I was talking to my mom about this. If you serve me a meal and there's a really good dish and a really bad dish, when in my comments about this meal, I'm going to say, well, this dish was really good and this dish was really bad. That's it. I know, that's really boring and really mundane, but that is my approach. I may get more upset about specific things, and I may gush more about specific things, but at the end of the day, I am telling you my honest opinion. That's that's the rule, that's the core goal. Now, I mention this because I've heard a few people kind of go about this particular episode and say that this is anti-fandom. Now, I've only seen this episode once, Prior to now, so this is my second viewing, as, as we've said, that's, that's just where we're at, with one exception after this point, which, which is the end of season six, because I've seen, watched that episode like five times. Um, but from I wanted to hold off on my thoughts about that until I rewatched it, and having rewatched it, I can firmly say this episode is not anti-fandom. It certainly touches on several very specific fandom tropes, not just with Quibble, though. It's worth noting. Rainbow also shows several of the more negative stereotypes as far as fandom tropes. But the very idea that's being presented here is it's okay to like things for different reasons. And, well, to be perfectly fr frank, there's nothing really wrong with... <sighs> let, me, let me walk this back a little bit. Let me take a few steps back here. <sighs> is it okay to be upset about fiction screwing up. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted to start with that because one of the things I've noticed is that too many people don't understand the fact that this is actually a fairly nuanced topic. I've heard entirely too often people say, oh, you just, you just expect too much from a video game. I got that comment yesterday. Or, oh, well, you, 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 are, not in, you are just entitled. I'm sure most of us heard that one when Mass Effect 3 came out. I've heard that crap for since the 90s, if I'm being completely honest. <laughs> so, that attitude can go to hell, because it's wrong. It is taking it too far to an extreme. But then there's the other attitude, which is, well, okay, I, I actively hate this, and I refuse to acknowledge it, and I'm actively going to try and go out of my way to bash or ruin other people's experiences simply because I have a particular opinion on this. Which is also wrong. It's like Danielle Picapau. Now, Danielle over there is not wrong. In fact, Danielle is incredibly right. But if Danielle was wrong, this would be a perfect... That was a terrible segue. I'm sorry. I usually do better at those segues. <laughs> you caught me at a bad moment. I'll put that towards the new Pokemon Snap. Thank you for the bit, Danielle. Um, now, yeah, I, I, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit here. Oh, it's my fault. I screwed up the segue. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Because... The point of the episode is made very clearly right at the end. Quibble doesn't change his mind. He still doesn't like the new books. And Rainbow doesn't change her mind. You know, she still doesn't get his point. But both of them are okay with this because it's okay to like something for different reasons. This is actually one of the things I love most about the Trek fandom, legitimately. The fact that Trek fans can disagree so strongly and so substantially and still enjoy Trek is awesome in my legitimate and honest opinion. And if I'm being honest, the overwhelming majority of my exposure to Trek fandom is positive. Like 99% range, you know? I, I mentioned one comment there, and I, I apologize that with uh, because you know I, I, it looks like I'm emphasizing the negative. Allow me to be very clear in that that is one comment amongst dozens, if not, I had to scroll down pages through positive comments and a couple negatives, and then more positive comments, and then more positive comments, and then more positive comments, and then more... I'm still scrolling down, just to get down to that comment. And that's just modern. 
Never mind back when I used to be part of the convention circuit or the message boards or any of that other fun stuff, you know? We can like something for different reasons. And even if we don't agree, we can still be friends and still both say we are both fans of a thing. It's that... I don't know how to put this better, but it's that moderation that I actually enjoy about fandoms in general, which is, you know, something that I tend to see more often than not. And I think that it's awesome that we can disagree on things and still have a civilized discussion about it. Too much attention, if I might just get a preachy for just a second here. I think too much attention is spent on the screeching chorus. Just, just a little bit. Because there is a screeching chorus. And the screeching chorus can go to hell. It doesn't matter what their opinion is, really. It's it, The fact that they're a screeching chorus is the problem. And they're gone. Alright, now that they're gone, the rest of us here can discuss and debate and just generally share enthusiasm, even if we disagree on things. Because I think Flutter Rudder is a lamentation, and S.A. Ross loves the episode for the fact that it is such an excellent showcasing of Flutter character. We even managed to find mutual ground on that. At least I think so. Because I think I understand your point, S.A. Ross, and I think you understand my point. And so we could just discuss that, even on something we violently disagree on. That's cool. I love that. Legitimately. There's, there's no... There's no sarcasm. There's no whatever. I, I love that. And I love those moments. We have a lot of those moments. I, I have a lot of those moments. It's, it's, the, it's rule zero, you know? Rule zero. Don't be a dick. It applies so universally. That's why it's called that. <sighs> um, so, you know... <laughs> In my all this whole section, by the way, all I wrote in my notes is, uh, I cover Trek for a living, or covered. I should use past tense at this point. Um, I guess I don't have anything else to say. I I've seen people like Quibble. I've actually gotten along with people like Quibble too. I know several people. Star Wars is one of the current hot hot topics, right? I'm like, ah, Star Wars is dead. I actually commented. In Discord, this is not a joke. Just now, because there's some people who are watching, I believe, the sequel trilogy uh, later today, and it's part of movie night. By the way, plug, plug. And they're like, "Yeah, no, Star Wars." If someone in chat, I'm not gonna name who, don't want to count anyone. Someone is like, "Star Wars is dead." And I was like, "That's a fascinating topic that we were just talking about." Like, I've I've known quite a few people who have that mentality, and there's nothing really wrong with that as long as you're being not a dick the whole time, right? Anyway, sorry, I feel like I'm going in circles here. Let's move on. So, can I just say, I love the the burger, the, the burger joint lady with, with the, the carrots on the grill in the background as they're arguing. And she's just going around her, her business in the background, getting everything set to go and blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Listen, Star Wars is dead. Well, no, see, Star Wars isn't dead. See, that's the thing, if you want to get into that topic. Because Star Wars isn't dead, demonstrably. But Star Wars may be dead to them. That is different. That is a different concept. Um, you know, for example, I could say... Uh, is there something I could say that about? I'm not sure I can say something about that. Whatever. I I've seen plenty of people say that Star Wars is dead to them. I've seen plenty of people say Star Trek is dead to them. You know, blah, blah, blah. But the point here is that as long as you add that proviso, you know, is dead to me, that's fine. Because that makes sense. No, legitimately. Either it's just moved beyond what you love and like, or it's something that's so completely new that you're not into it, or maybe you feel it's just lacking the heart and soul of what it is that you loved about it. I actually do have something. I, fig I figured something out. Blizzard. Now, Blizzard is actually dead, but let's ignore that for a second. Yeah, Blizzard is dead to me. In general. And that's not some kind of... Ugh, no, it, it's, it's, it's a sadness, you know? But So I do understand that mentality. Of course I do. But to say Blizzard is actually dead would, of course, be wrong. That's, that's a whole other topic, and that's why I wanted to distinguish that. Because something being actually dead is something that's happened. Star Trek has been dead at certain points of its history. Mega Man has been dead at certain points of its history. Etc., etc. Yeah, there's plenty of things that have died as a franchise. And in some cases, they've come back, you know? F-Zero is dead. Anyways. Moving on, moving on. 
I wouldn't say MLP is currently dead because we know they're working on the new show. And the new show's coming out soonish. So this is more like a gap as opposed to being as opposed to like Breath of Fire, which is actually dead, and there's no word or news of, of a new Breath of Fire coming out. Something like that. Anyways, um I love shared enthusiasm. It's one of my favorite things in uh reality. <laughs> I mean that with total sense. I love shared enthusiasm. I absolutely go, I gush, I gush about it. And the first chunk of this episode, right up until their argument, is just shared enthusiasm. It's just rainbow, like, ah, and Quibble's like, ah, and they're just, ah, ah. And it's just, it's just joy. It's just joy. I don't even have anything else to say about it. I just wanted to say that between the animation and, and the visuals of the camera, it's, it's just happiness. I don't have anything else to add to that. It's just very, very well done. So then they start arguing. Like fans do. Now, I tend to say that arguing is bad, discussing is good, but that that's a that's a definitions thing. There's nothing really wrong about getting this goes back to that topic there. There's nothing really wrong about getting impassioned about something you like, because that's why you're getting impassioned about it. As I've as we we literally just talked about this a few days ago. I forget what it was in reference to. It was either Pokemon or Dragon Warrior or something, but we were talking about how because we care, that's why we get emotional because we care that's why we get invested right if we didn't we wouldn't bring up a point we wouldn't make a fuss because we don't give a damn <laughs> right so of course the two get upset of course the two get angry it is interesting how the episode goes out of its way to show that in this moment both rainbow and quibble are wrong now someone i think it was act earlier said that quibble uh when he he's not that bad but he does go a little over the top sometimes i agree with that he does get a little passive aggressive at sometimes, and he's basically a jerk at sometimes. But I do like the fact that the episode bothers to show that both of them are in the wrong. It just does it in a different manner. He's obvious. She's personally going after uh, AK Rowling in order. Is it Rowling? No. AK Yearling. There we go. Sorry. AK Yearling. And being like. I have an emergency. I need to talk to you right now. There's a pony who doesn't believe that this stuff actually happened. And and would and doesn't let it go, too. <laughs> and she is she's like, this is this is a serious matter and we need to deal with it immediately. There's a pony, there's a fan who who is wrong. There's someone who's wrong on the internet. And I have to correct them. And that's the attitude she takes and the archetype she tends to go. And yeah, she effectively endangers Daring Do more than once because of the fact that her ego is pricked yeah because it's it's like you don't understand and yeah that's another one if you hate during so what x said is a perfect point to bring up if you hate during do so much why did you come here that's why i shared that voyager comment you remember that just like five minutes ago do you have a memory of a gold chip, goldfish it's okay it's okay my name's the lore runner you're watching me hi i'm sorry i'm being a dick point being that uh <laughs> That's why I shared that comment specifically. Is one of the more common comments I... Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Emphasizing the negative again. Amongst the negative comments, which is 1% of the comments I get on my Star Trek videos, of that 1%, the majority of that 1% are people saying, Lord, you hate Star Trek. Sorry, all. I, uh, I apparently hate Star Trek. And you see my point, though. This is a very common argument, and indeed, it is a part of a specific argumentative fallacy, the shutdown fallacy, the attempt to state something that completely ends the argument in question by already determining the end point for the other side. And that, that is a argumentative fallacy that I see quite a bit, and that is the one that, uh, that Rainbow Dash posits there, which, again, really shows how she is also wrong <laughs> you know so new um <laughs> so they go off on a real adventure i really like the setup of this a little bit i know this sounds strange but from a world building perspective i love the idea that something in universe has its own fan base that kevieron can just go to a, a you know a daring do convention because of course he would know it's there right i mean and of course, she's going to actually appear, so he knows that she's going to be there. And you see the logic there. Um, I do have to mention, though, that I do rather... I, I, I found myself wondering why it is 
that the the main six don't have their own conventions and their own fan ponies. And then I realized they don't merchandise and sell it. And that's the distinction. No, seriously. Miss Miss uh, Miss Yearling, she makes a decent amount of money off of what she does, so <laughs> that would kind of work that way, right? But I mean, my point is this makes so much sense even in universe. Even if everyone knew that Daring Do was real, I don't think they would stop being Daring Do fans at all. Let me ask you a question. Real talk for a second. Exactly, we are. That's what I've always assumed. That's how she gets her money to do her adventures is because she funds it. The main six don't have need of that because they're connected to royalty. But, you know. If you found out that Harry Potter, we'll use the obvious allegory, was real, uh, let's also assume you're a fan of Harry Potter for a second. Would you stop being a fan of Harry Potter? <laughs> and yeah, S.A. Ross is pointed quite valid. There are plenty of athletes who are real people who we are plenty jazzed about. There's plenty of actors, you know. Yeah, same with Star Trek. Vulcans are real. <gasps> Awesome. You know? And that's my point. In a setting where something that are the equivalent of superheroes exist, it makes a lot of sense to me from a world-building perspective that there would be in-universe fans to the point that they would have conventions about them. Frankly, I'm astonished the MCU has barely touched on this. I can kind of see why. But, you know, I, I do legitimately think that, you know, in the MCU, there should probably be Thor conventions or whatever. Where they all go and dress up as, as the different members of the Avengers, right? And just do the... Because of course they would. Yeah, Logan referenced it. Uh, Thor 2 references it briefly. One of the recent shows referenced it. There's, there's tiny, tiny touches on this concept. But it's the kind of thing that most of the time you don't really see when it comes to these things. It's, it's more of a modern concept for some reason. And yeah, The Boys actually touches on this too. So I just wanted to comment on that because... I would bet money that even by this point, uh, which is uh, season six of MLP, there probably are, you know, uh, I don't know what they would call them, like the Ponies of Harmony conventions, right? Somewhere in the background that we don't see going on. And of course, being a member of that doesn't always make sure you're going to get a loan from a bank, but that's neither here nor there. I should probably add something here. That's true. And there is the wing of the Smithsonian, although that's different. That's more of a historical thing. Since, you know, he was a major part of World War II. Anyways. So... Patton Oswalt is awesome in this episode. You may or may not know him from uh, Ratatouille as well. He's, he's a comedian. He does some good stuff. Um, I admit that there's several scenes where Quibble gets a little bit too much, like I said earlier. Patton Oswalt really helps smooth it out over. As I've said a hundred times, or probably more than that, a good voice actor can help smooth over an otherwise irritating or frustrating character. I've got two examples of that right off the top of my head. In Dragon Age Origins, there's a character who is horrifically, disgustingly evil. One of the most evil, petty, pathetic characters in that entire setting. But, um... <laughs> He's voiced by... Oh god, I still can't think of his name. Uh, Tim Curry, thank you, thank you. <laughs> god. A little tired. But he's voiced by Tim Curry. And so he goes from what should, by all intents, be a get-off-my-screen character to, yeah! And the other example I'm going to give is Kai Wynn, over in Deep Space Nine, who is 100% salvaged by her actress, being just that good at being that horrifically evil. She's so good at it. And the best part is she adds nuance to her character too. Little tidbits. She's so evil and yet she's so self-blinded and maybe she is, right? But the, and you can see that there's a person there. She adds dimension to what otherwise would be a very cardboard villain. Honestly, I could also say the same thing about Dukat. Uh, I'm pretty sure the only reason Dukat is the character he is is because of Mark Alemo. I've discussed that during the DS9 ruminations. But you see my point. I think Patton Oswalt helps salvage uh, him quite a bit. His snarking, not believing any of this. It's actually another type of humor. I forget the type. I didn't look it up for this one. It's 
something horrific and ridiculous is going on, and there's one person who's just going... and just rolling their eyes at the whole thing. Uh, it's the put-upon thing, right? It, it's the... Uh, the jaded cynic in the middle of the serious, who doesn't buy into it and doesn't go into it. In It's a form of the straight man approach. It might be the everyman thing, I'm not sure. But either way, it's a form It's a form of straight man humor, where everyone else is completely in character, and the one person is just... Yeah, okay, sure. Daring do, thank goodness, we're over here. <laughs> you know? And again, Patton Oswalt really helps with his delivery. All four? I mean, should at least one of them stay behind to guard us? And there's this great line, probably my favorite line of his is actually just a tiny little tidbit. Because when they're going over the bridge and it falls and he's laying, he's dangling by the rope and he turns to Rainbow Dash, he says, you need to get your money back. <laughs> and then they fall and it's great. Um, so what I love about this, uh, there's a little, there's a couple bits of, yeah, that's a, very bureaucratic, I like that. There's a couple bits about this. First of all, uh, there's some foreshadowing. He's, he's obviously good at puzzles and minutia. We see that with the lock. And we see the adventucation thing earlier. Now, what's really funny is, oh my god. This isn't the adventucation, is it? This is some cheap knockoff! I knew it. In all honesty, probably a Saros. This makes perfect sense. What's more logical? That you're in, you know, an adventure, a, 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 a LARP thing, or that Thor is real and the MCU is real. We'll go back to Harry Potter, we already said. Or Harry Potter is real. Now, you're probably thinking... Okay, yeah, no. Now here's the thing. Let's say something happens that makes you question that. Something that threatens yourself as you're going through this Harry Potter thing. So what's more logical? That this is the adventucation thing, or a cheap knockoff adventucation thing, or that it's real. Now the funny part about this, this logic chain is this logic chain makes perfect sense. First he doubts it because, oh yeah, sure. But then he doubts it because, okay, clearly this isn't real. It can't be real. But this is garbage. So, you know, you, you, I'm going to report you. Well, I'm not sure who I'm going to report you to. But I report you to somebody. Somebody important. But then, the best part here is the cheap knockoff thing. Logically speaking, and this is very logical, which follows his character. This is surprisingly well written. How many of you caught this? Someone who follows things so logically has determined that this can't be the actual adventucation thing. So it's a cheap knockoff. But then he sees a giant terrifying looking lizard. Now, if that is part of the adventucation thing, well then this can't be the legitimate thing because they don't have the money and, and standards that that would have. But if it's part of the cheap thing, then they can't afford that. So what's left? So it actually makes perfect logical sense that that is the thing that convinces him. And it's surprising how they actually line up that logical chain there. I had to comment on that. Because it's the perfect kind of thing to convince someone like him. Anyways, so yeah, he's like, oh my god, this is real, this is real. <laughs> yeah, he flips out. And then Rainbow hugs AK Yearling with this incredibly smug face. I love the expression. Of this. It'll just... <laughs> just... I can't even do it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually smiling too much. Like, legitimately smiling too much. Because she is just... Smug. <laughs> Hi, extremely famous friend. I see, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do smug. Uh, so then they go through the Daring Do Adventure, which I actually don't have much to comment on. It's good stuff. I like it. It's just I don't have that much to comment on it. But yeah, his tone changes completely, and while he still kind of stays quibble... He's more of a, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, um, this is, this is different and this should be here. And, um, I wouldn't check that one. Obviously it's this puzzle and he helps talk them through it and yada, yada, yada. And what's funny about this is he backseats cause he's still arrogant. He's still, you know, he's still backseating. But what's funny about this is Rainbow kind of goes along with what he says multiple times actually. Because he knows his stuff. And I started thinking about this. Even though it, it, what he's doing is kind of backseating, it's also kind of being the guy in the chair. If you think about it. It's not quite the same. It's kind of a half and half. But you can see the, 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 the parallels there. 
Because, yeah, he knows what he's doing. He's like, okay, figure this out. Do this. Mm -hmm. Hang on, let me, let me figure... Okay, go ahead and go over this. You know, mission control. Anywho. <clears throat> so, you know, they get the thing out. And he's like, all right, all right. And by the time they get out, I had to point out two other little things here. First of all, he's like, Rainbow Dash and I have got this covered. And so they, they end up water skiing him across the mud out. If you pay attention, it goes by very quickly. But if you freeze the, the episode, you can see as he's being to to towed out, he's got this big grin on his face like he's having the time of his life. You know? He's just like, yeah! <laughs> and I mentioned that because, once again, it goes back to my earlier point about him being a fan. Because he is a fan. He is into it, and he is actually enjoying himself. They escape. You know, I told you not to go over it. Okay, okay, okay. And then, I've got an idea. First first thing we're going to do, we're going to get some mud and rocks, and we're going to make a fake treasure, and we're going to do this. And we're gonna, okay, and then, and you could see, it, it's, it's just a little bit silly, but it is worth noting that what we're seeing is how much he's getting into the moment, because he is a fan. And they keep reiterating this point, I think, because that's one of the episode's core points. And, I mean, I've already shared this, but I wanted to point out that the epi this is not just on me, but the episode itself is making the point that he he's not a fake fan. He is an actual fan. He is someone who is into it and actually enjoys himself. And there's nothing wrong with that, within reason. I like X, you like Y. That's okay. Yeah. Right? They say it flat out. We don't have to agree on everything to get along, which is, of course, something that MLP has actually made that point before with the uh, with the Crusaders. Mr. Red, you should have more sardine paste on crackers. Then, okay, really quick. So then the ending credits thing, and I was going to listen to the whole thing. So I'm watching on Amazon, right? Because it's the easiest way for me to watch. And Amazon was like, all right, play next episode. I'm like, no, wait! I want to listen to the end credits. <laughs> Exit. Rewind. Cancel the play next thing. Okay. Okay, so I've, I've got this character. I don't want to name him because, you know, I don't want to give it too, too much weight. But I, I, there's, I've written a bit of fan fiction about them. And that's got the thing. But here's the thing. You know, in each one, each chapter, they go for a for a different puzzle. But what if each puzzle unlocks, uh, gives you a new karate move? <laughs> and yeah, fully ad-libbed, by the way. Fully ad-libbed. For those of you unaware. Just, uh, just Oswald thing. I wanted to share one other little factoid about this. Uh, back in September of 2014, Mr. Oswalt uh, had a random conversation with Mr. Miller. And apparently Oswalt's daughter was into MLP. And so the two ended up starting working together and connecting. And they ended up putting together the frameworks of what this episode would be, which was then handed to, uh, I think it's Haber? I looked this up already. Yeah, it's Haber and Vogel who ended up actually writing it. Two, two decent writers, too. And they're like, okay, hang on, hang on, let's... <laughs> Let's make this happen. And that's how Oswald is involved, and that's how this episode came to be. And I just wanted to share that, because I thought that was kind of cool. We need to rate this one. Blue. No, I'm kidding. What do you think? What do you think? Google gobble. Google gobble. S.A. Ross, of course, hates it, because S.A. Ross just is from Bizarro World. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm leaning towards red. I was going to say orange, because it's just a generally enjoyable episode with great visuals, great style, you know, excellent voice acting work, fantastic camera work, excellent facial work, good, great animation. You know, it's a high-quality episode. But what was pushing it into red for me, if I can talk this out here, is the is the point the core moral and core point of fandom i like x you like y and that's okay now i admit i am a little bit personally invested in this because i discuss track for a living but again this is something that's been a part of my life since i was in the single digit years like when i went to my very first star trek convention you know which i was very young when that happened so i've, I've been a part of fandoms for literally decades. I've seen this, and I've preached this very concept for decades. Honestly, when I was younger, most people wouldn't listen to me. Oh, you, you just don't know what you're talking about. 
Obviously, it's not really Star Trek if it doesn't involve Kirk. I remember those arguments, by the way. But yeah, it, it, I, I feel like it has a little extra oomph just for me. Which is why I, I'm you know, kind of leaning towards red on this one. And again, it's just a generally high quality episode, like I said. So, I'm seeing, I'm seeing not much dissatisfaction. I do try. I do actually take your all's account opinions into account. I can prove that <laughs> because Flutter Brother is not a, a lamentation. I can prove that definitively. So we'll, we'll we'll call that a red. <laughs> 